Hello, I'm Sam Ingalls. I'm the editor-in-chief of Sound on Sound magazine, and you're watching my Guide to Difficult Conversations in the Studio. How to have them, when to have them, when not to have them, and how to come out the other side without looking like a complete prat. It's always difficult to be the person who starts the conversation about money, but it is really important to start it and to start it as early as possible. And that's not just because it's nice to be able to feed the kids, it's also about respect. There's a critical moment in this conversation where the client says something like, so, how much is it going to cost me then? And you know the amount of money you should be saying, but it suddenly seems like a terrifyingly large number. Surely no one's going to pay that much to hire you and your little old studio. Well, it's really important to keep your nerve at that point, And that's not just because you want to be able to eat. The more the client is paying for you and your services, the more they'll value you and your services and the more they will respect you. Of all the sessions I've ever done, the ones that have gone really badly wrong have always been the ones where I decided to work for free or on mates' rates. As soon as the client is getting you for cheap, they'll start to treat you like something cheap. And the same goes in reverse too. If you don't feel you're being paid properly for your work, you won't do your work properly. You'll start making mistakes, and then the risk is that the low valuation you put on your services turns out to be right. I don't think I've ever done a recording session where there wasn't at least one oh sh moment. And that's not surprising. We're doing something difficult, we're doing it against the clock, no two sessions are ever exactly the same, we're bound to screw up sometimes. The question is, what do we say to the client when we realise we've screwed up? There are two things to bear in mind here. One is, of course, it's important to be honest and open and to take responsibility. But the other is that if you undermine the client's faith in your competence, you are never going to get that back. So think carefully about whether you actually need to have this conversation. As an engineer, the things that keep you awake at night might not actually be noticeable to the artist. And if it's a small thing or it's something you can easily fix while everyone else has gone to lunch, it might be better just to keep quiet about it. That's not a question of honesty, it's a question of what people need to know. As an engineer, you're constantly solving little problems in the background. If that includes a few problems that you made, so be it. On the other hand, if you've made a massive balls up of something, then obviously you need to say, because the artist is going to notice sooner or later anyway. And then the problem becomes not when do you tell them, but what are you going to do about it? Don't go in and go, I'm so sorry, I've made a complete mess of this, I'm going to kill myself, because that doesn't help anyone. Don't just offer them an apology, offer them a solution. Oh, you're right, there is a little bit of a buzz on that track, isn't there? I'm so sorry. I tell you what, we could either do another take, or if you'd rather not do that, I could try using noise reduction. You know, man, when I recorded at Abbey Road back in 1973, they used just a little bit of a pitch-shifted flanger on my vocal. I really, really like that effect. Can we, can we recreate that? Oh, yeah, cool, man. And uh, could you just uh, bring the bass up by 0.7 of a dB there? And Yeah, that's, that's lovely. And uh, if you could just uh, split off the high frequencies and, and put them through an old, an old boss chorus pedal. Artists who fancy themselves as engineers can be a bit of a pain to work with. They get really excited when they hear reverb and they want you to add far too much of it. Or they hate the sound of their own voice and want it mixed much too low. Or they keep asking you to turn the bass up in the monitors because their car stereo is wired wrong. I think the best way to deal with this is a combination of pushback and compromise. For instance, instead of saying, oh, don't be silly, that's far too much reverb, you could say, well... OK, but be aware that we're listening in an acoustically treated control room and what sounds like the right amount of reverb in here might actually be far too much when you get it into your car. But also, you could treat it as a challenge to put that much reverb on and still make it sound good. 
It's one of those really annoying laws of recording that the singers who most badly need pitch correction are often the ones who have the strong philosophical objections to pitch correction, and the drummers who can't keep time are the ones that think beat detective is a tool of the devil, so this can be a really sensitive topic. I think two things are key here. One is to remember that musicians often have really fragile confidence and it's absolutely vital that you don't do or say anything to undermine that confidence. But the other is to remember that these tools are only part of an overall production. So instead of coming right out and saying, I'd like to auto-tune your vocals, you could maybe say, how do you think the vocals ought to sound on this track? And get them to give you a few references. And if they come back and all their references are Neil Young records, then you probably should put away the Melodyne. But if they give you lots of glossy modern pop productions, then you've got a sort of license to go and use pitch correction. Because if they query it, you can come back and say, well, those references you gave me, that's how they got that sound. What should you say when a piece of kit goes down in the middle of a session? Well, it depends on the kit and the client and the session. Worst case scenario, the client has actually booked your studio solely because you advertise as having a big ticket item like a B3 or a U47. They turn up and it's not available. In that case, you need to grovel and get on the phone to hire companies. A lot of the time though, the client probably isn't actually that bothered about what kit they're using as long as it sounds good. So the most important thing is, once again, not to undermine their faith in your competence. So probably don't get on the talk back and go, oh shit, the knees just exploded. Instead, if you're setting up a complex session, leave a little bit of slack in the system. Keep one or two spare channels so that if something does go down, you can easily repatch without disrupting things. And what happens if the client breaks something of yours? Well, Again, it depends. If they've done something really stupid, like playing tennis with your vintage microphones, you will have to tell them to expect a bill. If it's a genuine accident, like the drummer hitting a mic with his stick, well, you probably have to suck it up and treat it as normal wear and tear. Either way, though, the most important thing is to clear the air straight away so it's not hanging around like a black cloud and souring the rest of the sessions. There is nothing more depressing in the world than slaving for days to get the best possible results from a tracking session only to be asked to hand over the files so that the bass player's cousin can mix it in his bedroom. Oh, well, he's got all the Waves plugins. Yeah, I bet he has. But really, the problem here is one of timing. If you're only having this conversation at the end of the tracking phase, then you're having it too late. It shouldn't ever come as a surprise that the artist wants someone else to mix their project, because if nothing else, that's going to make quite a lot of extra prep work for you. If you don't want them to do it, and they're determined to do it, there's a couple of things you could try. You could try and undercut the person they've chosen, which isn't going to go well if that's the bass player's cousin. Or you can try and show them what they're going to be missing. Take a few hours, do a really, really good rough mix. But whatever you do, don't be a dick about it. Don't give them stems with all your effects baked in. Don't give them all the files as a single polywav that can only be opened from the Linux command line. Don't get all secretive about your plugin settings. Because if they wanted confirmation that you're not professional enough to mix their record, that's exactly what you've given them. When a project goes sour, for whatever reason, there's a temptation to go, well, I don't care what you do with these recordings. Just don't put my name on them. Personally, I think that's a bit precious. Does it really matter if your name is associated with something that was badly mixed by the bass player's cousin? In the scheme of things, almost certainly not. So that's my guide to difficult conversations in the studio. If you want something pleasant to talk about in the studio instead, the new issue of Sound on Sound is out now. It's available in print, in PDF and you can read it for free at soundonsound.com. Thanks for watching.